prior to March, prior to when this pandemic struck, there were 37 million Americans hungry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, according to the census, according to the USDA census, 37 million people not able to get enough food to eat. We are now rapidly approaching 54 million. That's about 16% of our population. And um, the, the thing that I believe is that we need to pay attention to is that, and I think the opportunity in this, um, if there, are, I can't say that it's a pleasant opportunity, but the opportunity in all of this is that um, we are able, many people who have never really experienced this before are able to see, are able to bear witness to the uh, deep fault lines that are in, that, that make up our society, the deep fault lines in our food system and our, in our um, uh, uh, social sector and, um, and also in our lack of basic human rights. So I think there's an opportunity here to, as we, as we talk about how incredibly um, difficult it is for so many people. So many people are standing in food bank lines for the very first times in their lives. And many other people are witnessing those long lines because there's, you know, like here at the, in Brooklyn, the Barclay Center, um, it, you know, it, some days it wraps twice around and there's just not enough food that they, they run out. They have to say, we're, we're done, not enough food. And then you've got the North Texas uh, food bank that the day before Thanksgiving had six, six mile long um, a line of cars waiting to access food the day before Thanksgiving. So it is, it's dire, it's dire. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Rob can say the same thing about um, the sector that he's most passionate about, which is um, housing and homelessness. Talk to us about that wood, if you would, Rob, about the impact COVID is having on homelessness and housing. So for me, and, and thank you, Allison, and thank you, Mark. And I just, just a quick comment on Allison's review of the Barclay Center. For me, I, I was there one day last week and it was a stark reminder of just what Allison said. So I saw the line wrapped around. And then I look across the street at the Stop and Shop supermarket that is basically empty because people don't have the resources to go in there and purchase anything, right? So, you know, it really, you know, it can really paint a picture for you, a stark picture of reality of what's going on in our community now. But I think for me, Mark, um, there was a message from our government and it came from the Center for Disease Control in March, which was basically shelter in place. And I work in the financial district um, I'm formerly homeless, so it's an issue that I care about. And as I come to work every day through the Fulton Street train station, I see people that sleep in that train station on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. And it just, as I heard one day, I have the earphones and I'm hearing that message being repeated over the radio, shelter in place. And I sort of gasp for air, like, what do these folks do if they're telling you to stay inside? So it, it was a call to action for me personally, um, using... Uh, my my thoughts and the people that I'm connected to to sort of push uh, agencies in a certain direction. So I reached out to organizers across the country and said, we need to make an organized effort to push the federal government to put homeless, street homeless people into vacant hotels. And we ramped up those efforts early in March and were pretty much successful, you know, as successful as we could be with the money that was available. It just made sense. You have these vacant hotels, right? And you have people living on the street and you're, you're saying shelter in place, but they have no place to go. And I think the government, it made sense to the government also that they quickly negotiated deals through FEMA. It was a little weird. If you didn't understand the money flow, it mm -hmm. could be a problem in a particular city. But luckily, we have relationships with other organizations like Why Hunger and other folks who work on these issues that know how to access those funds. And that was with the support of the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty in D.C. that really connected us in a real way with the Center for Disease Control and understood the flow of those resources. Mm -hmm. So you were able to uh, get a sizable number of homeless housed in the hotels, Rob? Yeah, in New York City, there are about 15,000 people that either came out of congregate shelters, by that I mean living in closed spaces or street homeless that were moved into uh, single room 
hotels. They have their own room in a hotel right now, and it still exists. And as far as I know, those funds won't run out until February. But um, that is the question. What happens after February? Right. You know, you hear a lot of back and forth with the government now about a new stimulus package. Some say yes, some say no. And, you know, our government's not reacting. But this problem could flare up again, right? You know, the food issue, housing issues, because people lost work, Mark. And, you know, folks are still, you know, they're, they're hanging by a thread. And people right. are in survival mode right now. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a double-edged sword, Allison. We come to hunger and it comes to whole homelessness. But, but what we also want to do, um, as those of you are listening to this show, we want to encourage you, because you can do two things at once, especially if you're on your phone. Um, you can listen to this and then at the same time um, make a donation uh, to Hungerthon, because this is uh the time uh to do just that um to make a donation to help um with those um who are hungry who are dealing with these things we invite you to go to uh hungerthon.org while you're listening to us um allison why don't we talk a little bit about how long hungerthon has mm -hmm. been in existence um, what some of his successes have been and, and why each year it continues to grow and why it's so urgent this year in 2020. Sure. So thank you. Thank you for so much for this opportunity. Um, so we, the first Hungerthon campaign was in 1975, launched by Why Hunger. And it, since then, it's become an annual Thanksgiving tradition, predominantly on the radio. Um, it's branching out a little bit on podcasts and to other venues as well, which is really amazing. And it's been an opportunity for us to really not, not just raise critical funds to support the people that are on the front lines doing this work, but it's also an opportunity for us to raise awareness, for us to, to, to speak truth to power a little bit, for us to have a, have a put out a, um, a, spin a different narrative, right? Than the narrative that charity is what we need to be doing. We all have a moral obligation to be Yes, and charity will not end hunger. And we can end hunger. Hunger is a solvable problem. And I think that's a, a core message that we want to, um, to give to people. And particularly during this time of, of COVID and what it's wrought, it's really giving us the opportunity to, I think, amplify that message and, um, and speak to the urgency of it. Because so many people for the first time are seeing it for what it is and feel outraged by it. And in some ways, uh, what we're seeing is that there is definitely an increase um, in, in giving directly to food banks, which is really important now. Don't, don't get me wrong. People, people that are in need now need services. And I think it's still good to be outraged by the fact that the U.S. government, which should be providing, should be obligated to care for the most vulnerable, are not doing that and have not done that. In decades, so um, so it's a real it's a real both and you know issue here and, and something that we we really hope to get across and that uh, through this hunger th hungerthon campaign um, that we got to do something now at the same time that we're digging down to the roots of this problem and also understanding that it's not just about food it's about it's about housing it's about access to land it's about uh, water rights. Um, fundamentally, it's about human rights. I know that's what Rob and I believe, and that's where we've connected over the years, is that this is really a rights-based issue. And the U.S. has never, ever signed on to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights that we had a hand in developing in 1946 when Eleanor Roosevelt helped to write the U.N. Declaration on Human Rights. The, Our government has never, ever embraced that. Yeah. Rob, talk to us about the, the land issue, if you would, and where this fits into all of this. Yeah, I think, you know, if it, there's a, a theory that I learned early on, being homeless, when I came out of homelessness and started organizing and working in communities, the message was we need housing, 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 housing. But it didn't take too long for me to understand you can't control housing 
unless you control the land underneath it, right? Your, your life will always be at bay if you don't have access to land. 